This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Paul Herrera. Paul is the government uh, affairs director for realtors and their clients on local issues, helping to preserve and protect property rights and the value of home ownership, working with colleagues at the California Association of Realtors and the National Association of Realtors. Paul helps members make a difference for their clients at the local, state, and federal levels. His unique experience includes an award-winning journalism career with newspapers in Florida and California, where he covered real estate, small business, the aviation business, and the confluence of government policy, politics, and business. Paul serves as communications director for the San Bernardino County of Economic Development Agency. He oversaw external communications, managed a, a communications team, and helped publicly position a variety of projects and initiatives. The combination of mass media experience, local experience, policy, and political background, and understanding of real estate issues prepared him to lead IVAR's government affairs and communications efforts through coalition building, strong mes messaging, <laughs> almost said massaging, and <laughs> understanding. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that's partly true, too. Paul, welcome back. We, we've talked a few times before. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Well, thanks for being an advocate for our industry. And uh, I guess I just want to first talk about you're in meetings with these people that are trying to make a living all the time. What's uh, what's the mood of the agent with what's gone on this year? You know, it's interesting. A lot of the people that I communicate with the most have been in the business for quite a while. You know, they're the more senior brokers um, and agents who were there through 2008 and right. 2010. So for those folks, um, they they seem to have a pretty good um, uh, outlook in terms of, hey, this is going to weed out a lot of the folks who just dropped in to say hi in the last couple of years, but don't necessarily have the staying power. And, you know, they survived that and they'll survive this. Okay. Um, for newer agents who haven't really established, boy, you know, you cut down uh, transaction numbers by 40%. That's their uh, piece of the pie that just uh, <laughs> walked away. That's so right. it depends. It, it's a, it's definitely, um, you know, we've grown uh, as an organization quite a bit through new membership because so many people jumped into real estate over the last few years. Um, you know, I, we expect to see uh, those numbers shrink and, and our membership numbers shrink. You know, there just isn't enough business to carry uh you know, quarter million realtors in the state of California. No, which is really interesting because I don't really know how that gets categorized as unemployed. You know, you have non unemployed, but not making anything. Mm -hmm. So is that same with a, a, say a lender? So the people yeah. that are doing refis, uh, that business probably is almost non-existent. You may still be in the lending business, but there's a big piece of your business that represented more than 50% of your volume that's now gone to almost zero. Oh, you've seen uh, significant layoffs um, and cutbacks in, in that business. Now in a, I don't know, a year or two, you know, you're going to see some people with 7% uh, loans that may have an opportunity to do something with that. Yes, that's sure true. what that volume is, but you know, it's always yeah. typical there. You know, with, with the agents, um, you, you mentioned unemployment. I mean, the reality is that uh, I haven't looked at it in, in recent years, but uh, the last time I looked at it, it was something like 55% of eight of realtors had not done a transaction in the last two years. That is true. It's so excited at the top where the volume is. Yeah. So they're making a business, their, their money doing something else. Some, some of them are retired and maintain a license. Some of them are have another career and also do real estate. Some of them are just referral agents. Um, but there's a lot of folks who carry a license and, you know, it's pretty inexpensive to, to be a realtor. You know, 2029, let's say 2019, 2020 and 2021, you probably had people refining their house multiple times, maybe even more than once a year. Oh yeah. It kept getting better and better. Mm -hmm. So that, that also 
kinase is, is a very good underlay of protection because right now your, your demand is down 40 to 50%, but you have a lot of people that are thinking, well, why would I move? I've got a two or 3% loan. So oh, yeah. that problem's not showing up on the MLS maybe ever. Yeah, that, that's a challenge now. Um, you know, all this has been very good for the consumer who was already in a house. Right. Um, but nowadays, um, you know, it's, it's hard to stare down your 3% loan and think, well, you know, we'd like to have one more bedroom. Uh, <laughs> it'd be nice to have an extra, you know, 500 square feet in the house. Why don't we move, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood? No, you know, you, you'll make do <laughs> with uh, with what you got. Well, you know, a lot of people did that project, though, uh, when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what happened to Home Depot. They got, you know, remember the wood? There was no wood, yeah. drywall, and it went up like crazy. Well, a lot of that was, okay, I want an office at home. I want an extra bedroom. I've always wanted one. Almost everything that you put off, it was kind of crazy. If you ever looked like, like at a, a boat sale chart, mm -hmm. it went crazy. Yeah. Pianos went crazy. So anything that you put off for your life, all of a sudden it was like game on. We're, we're going to get it. We're finally going to get it. You know, all that money that was being spent um, in offices and centralized workplaces now had to be spent, you know, creating your, your workspace at home, especially for yeah. those who had the resources to do so. Um, I mean, I'm wondering um, how, uh, um, contracting is going to shift these next couple of years. I mean, they, they had a book of business. You couldn't get a contractor, you know, in, in, um, uh, in late 2020. Um, I was trying to get a few things done at home and boy, getting somebody to come around was, was difficult. Uh, Very much. Yeah, people they tapped, they tapped their equity. Uh, they tapped the available cash, um, probably accelerated by many years, a number of projects at home. Sure. So does that mean that now, you know, they've used up, uh, you know, all the slack that was, that was existing in, in, uh, in future projects. I, I don't know. Well, a lot of it, I, I think that's, that's really an accurate assessment. How many offices do you need in your house? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you did it, it was okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get to work at home. You know, I can be remote. So you kind of got that done. And then you couple that with a mortgage rate that starts with a two or a three. Yeah. You could see the case where that house isn't showing back up. Yeah, and it depends on what happens with uh, with remote work going forward. Um, you know how how do how do these attitudes change um, over the next couple of years? I mean, you're already seeing a lot of pushback into the office. Sure. Um, so I, yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see where this goes. I mean, you had folks that you know thought they'd remote work forever and moved out to another state, moved mm -hmm. out to. I mean, you saw the demand out in Yucca Valley and resort communities in Idaho, um, in Utah. And, you know, at this point, do they have to uh, sell and come back someplace that at least gets them into the office three or four days a week? You know, that's it's going to be really interesting for some of those markets. Yeah, the new construction, it'll be interesting to see the charts coming out because um, you've gone from feeling like, OK, doesn't matter what it costs me because your costs was accelerating while you're building because of mm -hmm. uh, various parts being hard to get or labor being hard to get. But you always, you always thought I could add it to the price at the end for sure. And it's going to be a bidding war. So I'm, I don't even want to put a new house under contract at the beginning of construction because you've right. been out on a hundred grand or something. Now that's a whole different game. The, the, we call it mood, the moodometer shift. And uh, we are now in quadrant two where prices are decelerating and the mood has shifted in strength of the buyer instead of the seller. And yeah. uh, it's, it's being a seller in 2021 was mind boggling because of what occurred. You'd get your property be on the market for four hours. You'd have 11 offers that accelerated it by more than you ever imagined. And uh, you can kind of get spoiled in that. Yeah. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's not reality. Now we're now we're back to reality. In in some ways, it's probably a healthier thing to have a mortgage that's somewhere not at two percent. You know, it's it may be five or six because the other side of it, somebody's got savings they're trying to make interest on. So it's sort right. of more of a it's a better balance, but it doesn't mean it's going to be an easy transition. That's for sure. 
Yeah, I'm sure you've gone through so many examples of what happened in uh, 2020, but we we experienced it firsthand. I mean, the home we bought in San Diego, uh, we were looking to buy a home in January, February of 2020, just before the pandemic. Right. We found a place that we loved, made an offer. I think uh, uh, list price was 870, made a full price offer at 870. Uh, that was the first week of March. Uh, four or five days later, lockdown, uh, everybody go home. Right. Um, you know, the seller, when they got our offer said, okay, you know, we'll think about it and let's see what else comes in. A uh, couple of days later, we'll take it. <laughs> um, and so we take a moment to pause and say, hang on, where's this headed? Right. Um, because we're seeing how, how bad this could become. Uh, you saw the collapse in oil prices, all that was happening as we were sitting there saying, do we go through with this? And ultimately we decided, you know what? They're not really building single family homes in San Diego anymore. And we're not trying to make money on it in the next couple of years. This is our home for the next 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. So what do I care if it goes down 20% this year? It's not going to fall long-term. Um, and so we closed um, and we got a loan at 2, 2.7%. <laughs> it, was a, it was a weird weekend, which everything collapsed. And so loan rates were actually more like three and a half, three and three quarters. Right. And they collapsed over a course like three days. And we locked in at like 2.7% wow. before they came back up. So we got wow. the price and the loan. And six weeks later, that same house would have sold for about an extra $200,000. And then six the weeks. prices went down further. And our neighbors that moved in that, in that time, I mean, those homes went for $1.2 million, $1.3 million. Um, six months later, eight months later. Yeah. So, I mean, we saw the, <laughs> the insanity were, of it. There were two groups uh, uh, that simultaneous, the the pandemic created two groups of urgencies. There was a group saying, okay, we're taking our house off the market. Mm-hmm. So 45% of the listings disappeared. Yeah. On the other side, you had the demand increase by people saying, I have to get out of where I am. Yeah. And so a big group of demand buyers that had to have one got met 45% less inventory to make an offer on. And that yeah. world collided and the price just went bam, you know, just crazy. Yeah. The 1100 square foot downtown condo in LA was a lot less attractive when it also became their kid's school and their office. Right. That's right. That's and right. it had some value. And so they started looking to where they could find, you know, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, you know, some bathrooms and some space. So you're involved in the legislation side. Mm-hmm. And so how do you think the pandemic impacted what's what's come out the last say 18 months uh pretty drastically um you know just before the pandemic there were a lot of real concerns about what happened what happened with local budgets so for instance uh riverside county was on a glide path to insolvency as an example you know and counties are are significantly funded by property taxes a number of cities were on glide paths towards serious financial problems, uh, largely because of uh, pension obligations that they had, you know, promises they made like in 2002, 2003. Right. And now the folks are retiring. And right. so they're trying to figure out how do we make ends meet? Um, what would be the cuts? What would be the tax increases potentially? Pandemic happens and it solved everybody's problems. Um wow mostly because the federal government printed an ungodly amount of money, right. passed it down to local governments. Also, people did a bunch of uh, online shopping. Um, sales taxes went up. You saw huge increases in uh, uh, in investments after that initial panic in March of 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, suddenly, everybody was a stock market genius. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you know, capital gains kicked in, and just money came in from flowing from all directions. And now... All these local governments are in fine shape. No one needs money. Um, wow. It's solved all their problems. Um, even many the long, them, even long, the long range problems. Even the long range problems, because the, it wasn't really a long range problem. It was like a 10 year problem of this, uh, of trying to get past this segment of uh, retiring uh, okay. pension obligations okay. where the costs really went up. Um, after 10 years, it would be okay, but they couldn't figure out how they're going to make ends meet for this, for this period of time, starting like 20, like right now, actually. Okay. Um, 
So that really fixed their budgets. You know, the state government collected, um, what, about $130 billion in surpluses over the past uh, three years. Um, actually, more than that, because they ended up with close to $100 billion surplus last year. Um, so a lot of those issues got resolved. It also meant that for the first time in a long time, legislatively, we weren't fighting off tax increase proposals left and right. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really hard to justify proposing a new tax when you're sitting at a hundred billion dollar surplus. You know, just for for context, what a hundred billion dollars means is to the state of California, the entire state budget a decade ago was about a hundred billion dollars. Wow! So the surplus alone uh, was that uh, last year, and last year I think the state collected about a little over three hundred billion in uh, in revenue. So now we go into a year in which the opposite is true. Um, the state's facing some deficit. Um, about, uh, I think they predicted twenty-two billion was the number that came out of the governor. Okay. Um, still, revenues are two and a half times what they were uh, a decade ago. But you know, expenses have gone up with it. Promises have gone up with it, um, and the state's going to have to you know tighten its belt a little bit. Um, I'm expecting to see some of these tax proposals at least get floated. And we have to deal with them a little bit more seriously. And, and whenever the state looks at raise taxes, it's going to raise taxes on the people who either own property or can afford to buy some. Right. When you're a hundred billion dollars in in the black, is that in a savings account, or do you find a way to spend it at the by the end of the year? Uh, both things happen. So okay. there's a there's a pretty uh, healthy rainy, rainy day fund now. Okay. Um, the governor has said he does not want to uh, use it this time. Basically, there's bigger storms coming than than twenty two billion dollars this year. Um, and the governor, to his credit, vetoed um, I want to say about sixty bills that would have raised spending at the end of last last session. Um, looking towards this potential, uh, what was really uh, sizing up as uh, loss of revenue over the next couple of years. For those not familiar, the state of California is largely funded by its uh, higher income earners. And by capital gains, um, so regular, you know, working class folks are not the ones paying the bills in California, um, which means that in really good years, when the stock market's doing well and everything's going up and business is strong, the state runs a lot of surpluses. But when the when the stock market's not doing well and IPOs aren't hitting the market, it shifts the other way and very very quickly. Even when you know unemployment's fine and you know, middle class uh, incomes are doing okay. Those aren't the folks the state relies on. Paul, can, can you can you uh, clarify what's what's a California high income earner like? Is it somebody just north of a million? Somebody ten million, a hundred million? What does that look like? Um. So in California, there's there's multiple tiers. California has a very progressive uh, tax structure. Uh, progressive referring to uh, you know higher income earners pay a high proportion of taxes. Um, so if, if you recall, um, when the state was trying to make ends meet, uh, voters passed an, uh, an initiative uh, raising the top tax rate to, uh, guys, at 13.9% yeah. on incomes over over half a million. Uh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting that because there was a second surplus tax that was added to that. So you're really talking... I mean, once you start making a couple hundred thousand dollars, your income taxes go significantly northward. Uh, once you start getting into the half million and up range, it goes significantly up above that. Um, you know, get over a million, it keeps going higher and higher. So um, you're not talking about people who are wealthy and never thinking about money again, especially if you're trying to uh, uh, live in uh, the Bay Area, you know, or or uh, I mean, even large parts of San Diego, where the or Orange County, where the median home price is now uh, a seven-figure digit um, or seven-digit figure somewhere. Um, but you know, that's that's a high income earner in California. So, so in large part, a lot like a lot of our clientele, you know, worked hard. Oh, yeah. You know, got some two or three properties that you know that they've you know secured, and now they're you know being successful as you know small real estate investors. But they they they're qualifying as your high income earner. Yeah, yeah. If you're um, if you're able to afford to go out into marketplace and purchase rental property, you're absolutely uh, paying uh, higher income tax rates in, in the state of California. 
Yeah, California has been losing people, you know, a fair amount. Um, more than's coming in. There's some, I think the last number I looked at was something like 400,000. But we also decided we weren't going to build enough homes. Yeah. So it seems like when I look at the legislation, um, it seems like there's been a lot of effort, certainly in the last couple of years, to find some some place for somebody to live that doesn't have to be a new structure. So yeah, ADUs is a, a certainly a big category. And then even uh, maybe you can help me understand if I have a, what used to be an R1 lot that has enough space, mm -hmm. can I do something additional on that? Yeah, um, it, it's pretty restricted. You know, that when, when um, you, I think you're referring to SB9, um, the uh, legislation that allows for a lot split under certain circumstances. Um, okay. But essentially with the, uh, with the um, creation of the ADU legislation that we worked on over a couple of years, we had already turned single family lots, you know, if they were large enough and had the setback requirements into up to three unit um, lots because you could build an ADU and then you could build a junior ADU. Junior ADU being an attached um, uh, ADU, like a garage conversion uh, or yeah. you know, an office conversion. Um, SB9 added one more piece to that, which is you could take a single family lot if it met the requirements uh, and they're not that easy to meet, to be honest with you. Um, and you could split that lot to two separate single family lots. And on each one, you could build a, uh, a home and an ADU. So now you take the lot that was once a single family home, then became a single family home plus an ADU, then became you know three units to now possibly four units. Um, but it, you know, people really have to take a look at the fine print on that. Um, and there was uh, some recent coverage about how little SB9 has done. It really wasn't meant to be a giant problem solver. Um, it's meant for owner occupants. You really can't be an investor that picks up a lot and splits it. Um, it's it's designed to work in you know the lot's got to be big enough to accommodate. Um, being split and still uh, maintain uh, setbacks and other local requirements. Um, so even in the most optimistic view, uh, I think the estimate was that maybe two to two and a half percent of single family lots in California might qualify um, okay. under SB9. Uh, and that's qualify. You know, there's plenty of people who own these lots who aren't interested in doing this. Okay. It's, so it's really not replacing new home building. No, absolutely yeah. not. So is demand still exceed supply? Oh, I mean, especially now. Uh, but yes, um, you know, the the real challenge with home building is that we screwed this up 30 years ago. You know, we, we didn't start messing this up in 2010. Um, you know, if we wanted to really fix housing affordability in California, what we really need are about a million 30-year-old apartments, you know, where the construction loans have been paid off and, you know, they, they start becoming a more affordable product. Uh, well, you can't go back and do that. So what we're facing is you can build new, but you can't build new and uh, lease it out for 1400 bucks a month and, you know, <laughs> make any profit off that on any right. kind of multifamily unit. Right. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw the reports out of uh, Los Angeles uh, and other governments trying to build uh, just uh, adapt housing uh, to uh, take in uh, uh, homeless individuals, um, and that they were looking at you know an efficiency costing six hundred seven hundred thousand dollars to build, crazy, with no profit margin attached to it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, California is a tough regulatory state. Um, there's a lot of issues with uh, with trying to get more things off the ground. You know, people imagine that. The reason rents are high is because landlords are greedy. Like, no, <laughs> it costs money to build here and there's a lack of supply. Well, that's interesting. You know, since you probably have a lot of people now that that aren't going to buy a new house at 6% mortgage because they can't get qualified, mm -hmm. they still will be in California wanting to rent. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if the rents are supported because I know rents went up an awful lot. You know, right. in Florida, they went up 50% in two years, basically. So now that that, that urgency, I think the rent ran after the prices ran. I, in a way, that seems like it would happen. The price ran up so much that you had now an expectation that housing 
there was an expectation of the renter actually that rents were going to be raised every year. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, part of their expectation was I'm still going to stay and you can raise the rent. I, I wonder if the mood is shifting on that. So, you know, a year from now with the rentals that I have, I just emailed my property manager that question. So how firm do you think uh, the on the renewals, how firm do you think the rental rates will be? And so, yeah, he gave that some thought and he said there could be some softening there. I would expect to see some. There is more um, there is more supply that started getting green greenlit last couple of years. Um, we were able to work on getting some of the uh, restrictions, especially at local governments, uh, softened. So it was easier to get things uh, permitted and uh, on uh, underway. So as that leads to new supply, you would imagine, uh, and also if, you know, if people aren't flocking to California and they've been flocking out of California, mm -hmm. you know, all that should soften some of, some of the demand. Um, but it's a little more complicated than that. You know, one of the things that high housing costs create in California is overcrowded housing. Um, so when I, when I talk to lawmakers who are, trying to keep rental costs down by imposing government restrictions, rent controls, and, you know, and, and other restrictions. One of the things I point out is that you have, uh, you have in many cases, uh, younger people, younger professionals who are crowding into housing um, because that's the only way they can afford it. Now, let's say you made it so that, you know, the four roommates uh, sharing a two bedroom place could afford it with just two of them. Where are the other two going to go? Right. That's a, another, another house that has to be occupied. Yeah. They, they don't have anywhere to go. You know, like if you could artificially just push down everybody's rent, cut everybody's rent in half, you would just have a bunch of homeless people because you don't have, it's not like there's a bunch of empty units sitting out there uh, unoccupied uh, because, you know, the, the, uh, the owner, you know, is demanding they get this high price. No, they're filled up. But what was interesting, as you know, my son Aaron passed away. And one of the things I did is I drove, I drove around just to see the houses that he had lived in. Yeah. And you know, what was common cars on the park. The cars were parked on the grass every time a hundred percent of the houses had like two or three times as many cars as I would have expected. You know, it has, it had a two car garage. No, that's not enough. We have two yeah. cars outside the garage and two cars on the, on the yard. And I was just thinking, Holy cow, density is not safe. In my opinion, you know, as a property buyer, that's one thing that's a red flag when you see like you have an area of fourplexes that were famous in San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. These were 4,000 square foot fourplexes, and they li literally started getting torn down because it was such a dangerous area. You just yeah. had too many people in too tight a spot. Well, we're doing that in some really prime single family areas. Like I used to live on Spruce Street. Well, that was where all the professors lived for the colleges. You go down that street now, there's cars everywhere. Yeah. Going, holy cow. <laughs> yeah, you see that. I mean, down in San Diego, um, you'll see some of the older neighborhoods around uh, Balboa Park. Um, and there's not a parking space anywhere. Um, you go into, I mean, this has been true in LA for a long time, actually. Uh, those single family neighborhoods uh, around downtown area. I mean, they're packed. Um, and you get a couple of impacts. You know, one of them is that... Um, if you're looking to invest in an area and the reality is that that's what you're facing, you, you know, if you have overcrowded housing, you also put a lot of wear and tear on that housing very quickly. Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real, real challenge. You know, the only way out of it is going to be the investment into more housing. Um, and that's not a, something that fixes the problem for uh you know, college students that are getting jobs and starting to go to work. Yeah, you don't solve that quickly. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01. 219911 Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577 and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to the Norris Group.com and click the hard money tab.